I'm going to turn this over to our fabulous speaker, presenter, author of the Chapelai House Book, which is the library's one book on community title for spring 2022, Ms. Gwen Rowland. Thank you so much. And once again, I'd like to thank the libraries for selecting a Chapel Eye House vote for their 2022 One Book, One Community Read. It's just such a great honor. And it's been so overwhelming to meet so many people who love this little book. Um, one of the questions asked for the interview that we just did a few minutes ago that's going to be on uh, the library website is, uh, I forgot what it was. Oh, how do I know when I'm successful as a writer? Is it when I get paid? Is it when I get a big assignment? When is it? And I didn't even have to think a second. It's when one reader tells me they connected with it. And it just fills a writer's heart up. And that's what makes it worth all the work. And today, our program is about passing down traditions and stories in your own family, whether you're a writer or not. And I hope that from our discussion today, someday someone's going to say, Mama, Grandma, Great Aunt, I'm so glad you told me that story. And, or taught me that recipe and why it was so important to you. And that will be success. I grew up with jelly jars cooling in the window, like a lot of you may have. And then after they cooled, they would go on the top of the um, cabinets in the kitchen. Ours were all black because we had blackberries. Every now and then, my Aunt Dubby would bring a jar of plum or mayha, and I would capture that jar for myself because I was sick and tired of blackberry, but it was the only sweet we had in our house. Oh, occasionally some figs. And later, of course, I could get blackberry jelly after I grew up. That's my favorite now, isn't it? That's the way we are. But uh, Mama taught me how to make jelly. I just watched her and helped her as I needed to, and that's the way she learned. It was just absorbed because kids helped the family do things. And so I learned to make jelly the same way she did. And now I make, I have at the place we live now, made uh, from our blueberries, our muscadines. This picture is with my muscadines. And we also have pear trees and fig trees and pawpaw trees. And we have made food from those uh, all the time that we've lived here. And it was so it was no surprise that I grew up to do this because I grew up watching grown-ups do it. It was my grandma Josephine who taught my mama how to do it, unconsciously probably. It was probably, Helen, go over there and stir that while I get these jars ready. That's how casually things can be passed down in a family. And just as this woman, Josephine Ashley Vozang, passed down things like recipes to her children, which then came to her grandchildren, she also unconsciously fired my imagination. As I followed her around doing things like she you see in this picture here, getting water out of an old cistern made out of pontoons that they had brought from Bayou Shane after uh, they moved from there, she was probably telling me about her life as a child and a young adult in Bayou Shane. And she made it sound like the best place in the world. Everybody got along. She was raised in the post office, which was also the general store, and that's where she learned to read. And there were little houseboats and houses all along the bank, and people's boats and pirogues were tied up there. And it just sounded so beautiful. And we went to Sunday school a lot. And I sort of imagined that Bayou Shane was like the Garden of Eden and that everybody's family came there from there. But as I got older, I found out other people came from other places, not Bayou Shane. In fact, no one even knew of Bayou Shane. And by the time I was a teenager, I think I had filed away 
those Bayou Shane stories right with the stories about the centaurs that I read about in the encyclopedia, how I wanted to be a centaur. To be half horse would have been heaven for me because I loved horses so much. But after a while, you just gradually lose these things that don't seem to have facts to back them up. It wasn't until Calvin and I moved out there that I started thinking, well, maybe there was something about those old stories because I would hear Al Seed and Peter Bunch and other old, the other few old people who still lived out there talk about when it was a community, when so-and-so was at school and got in trouble because he uh, did such and such. The Miller Diamond was leaning down getting a drink of water and another boy shoved his head down. Well, these stories made this place feel more real to me, even though there were not, there was no community out there again. But this graphic here shows, uh, I don't really know who started this drawing years ago, but I got it from Bayou Shane, and it was some old person's memory of where the houses were. Could have been Al Seed that uh, helped with this map. And there were about 350 families out there when my grandma was a little girl learning to read at the post office, which was a store, so she said. But later, after listening to Al Seed's stories a little more, I started thinking Mama might have sanitized her stories a little bit, and that Bayou Shane might have been more than just the Sunday afternoon picnic on the grounds that she remembered. This is an, a picture from 1904 at the Methodist Church gathering, and she's probably in there because she went to the Methodist Church back then. And it was, you can see it really was a beautiful place. I saw, first saw this picture when Gladys Case's little pamphlet came, little book came out about Bayou Shane. And that was when we were already living out there. So this made me think more that she might have been telling more of a truth than I realized at, at, in those years that I had forgotten. And this shows how the water changed, which in my mind is kind of the way stories can be. In the old days, when Mama would have been back out, would have been out there for hundreds of years, the water that flowed down from the upper Atchafalaya was like a Celtic knot of bayous and, uh, and interchanges and uh, cutoffs and things. And the water would sort of meander down and fill up the swamp and it could fill gradually with nutrients and then go back down. After the 1927 flood, it be that became a channel and it was more like flushing a toilet and water would just gush down. And I kind of see stories as being, and information being passed down in those two different ways. People can sort of meander and have the, these fine nuances and emotions in them, or you can just have dry, hard facts. And sometimes, for whatever use you're making of it, one of those methods is better than another. And sometimes you need both. Some of you, I, I know, are old enough to remember when Calvin Bozan and I actually lived in the swamp in the 1970s. And some of you are younger than that and just grew up with the articles and photographs of, that C.C. Lockwood produced. And then others, I think there are some here young enough that would probably been introduced to all of that history through the documentary that uh, Christina Melton produced for LPB. So you have, we have all these generations who absorbed the story of the life that Calvin and I lived out there through all these different ways. We were among some of the last people to live full time out there. And at the time we were doing it, we didn't think it was anything special. We certainly didn't think we were going to be part of history. We didn't think anyone would ever even know we'd been out there after we died. Calvin learned from his grandfather, George Ray, and other old people how to make a living out there. And they also instilled in him a love for being out there in the swamp.
So in his early 20s, as other boys, maybe even right there at Bayou Sorrel, were thinking of getting out into more civilization, a more progressive place to live perhaps, Calvin was looking at taking a step back. He had inherited this love of those old ways of doing things, and that's what he wanted to do. And in some of these old pictures that we took in black and white, he actually looks like he could have been from 1907. What his plan was, and he executed this as a young man in his 20s, helped by friends also in their 20s, moved this big house from Bayou Sorrel back out to the swamp. I've never asked him where this house came from. It was the house he was raised in. But a lot of the houses at Bayou Shane were either moved intact or the lumber was taken down and the houses were rebuilt after the 1927 flood. So it's possible this house was one of those. Uh, he's here today, and maybe in the question and answer session, he can tell us where it came from, and maybe even give us a little clue as to how in the world he and these other boys moved this house out to the swamp, because at the time, I don't remember asking him about that. During graduate school, I started going out there with him on weekends, and then I got all my classes that I taught and the classes I took on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. So Thursday night I could go out there and then come running back in sometimes on Tuesday morning, probably with cypress needles in my hair. And, uh, and then when I graduated, when I, got, I finished my master's, we went out there full time and had a magical year. But then, just like the people of the old community, we had a major flood that took our house. And this picture was taken by a friend one night, uh, one morning after we had camped out there and were trying to salvage some of the materials from the old house. And I remember the dejection we felt that how do you start all the way over, and so many of you have gone through some of these major floods lately, even in civilization, and uh, I don't know that it's even feasible for anyone today to say, well, we could build a houseboat in case there's another one, but that's exactly what Calvin said, and it was foreign to me to think of a houseboat. I knew of were those little small ones that people had for fishing camps. But Calvin was born in a houseboat, and he grew up at Bayou Sorrel, where a lot of people still had them and had raised families in them. So even though I said not much, he encouraged me that we could do this. And so we went off our separate ways for a year and earned some money, and he eventually found a barge to buy and uh, a house on a plantation in Plaquemin that we could tear down and pull the nails out of and, uh, and uh, build. That's how we built the houseboat. And by the time we moved out there, there was no community. It was us and a lot of trees lying in the bank. And we could take a boat ride to go see Al Seed or Peter Bunch. And we'd go a little further and see Myrtle and her husband, Myrtle Burns uh, Bigler, and her husband, Harold Bigler. And they stayed out there until they died in the 1980s. But there was no general community anymore. Their Al C was still living there. He had gone back and forth out to civilization at different times in his life. And this is a Barrett family from the early 1900s, and Al C could very possibly be one of the children in there. So he was our bridge, he and Peter Bunch, as to what it was like in the past and what it was like in the time we were there. And even though we enjoyed their tales, they varied quite a bit from what Grandma had told me Bayou Shane was like. They told a lot of stories about fights and uh, uh, people going missing, just rougher things than, than she had ever told us about. And the most unusual thing was they said that, they, that it was rumored that the other half of the post office may have been a saloon. 
And uh, I think I raised that question with her, and she was adamant that it had never been a question. And I have since seen on the Bayou Shane Facebook site other descendants of some of those families uh, discussing whether it was a saloon or whether it was a general store. We did a lot of things just like the old people did. I think Calvin's net hoop nets probably looked the same. And I don't know about crawfish traps. I think they uh, may have changed some over the generations. But every season there was something to love and something wonderful to do every day. We were never bored. We aged out there. As years went by, we matured. And we figured out ways to do things that the old people either didn't have access to or we just felt like was a better way to do it. On the, the picture in the black hat is when Calvin had just moved out there. And then uh, the red hat is uh, probably about 1970. Cold day. I certainly wasn't the first woman to hang clothes from a P-Rogue. I'm pretty sure all the women of Bayou Shane at some time or other had to do that. And we weren't the first people to float our chickens or other livestock on rafts. I've read they even floated cattle on rafts in deer and high water. But we were the first ones probably to use styrofoam for our rafts whenever the oil field workers would leave these big refrigerator-sized pieces of styrofoam, we grabbed every piece we could find because there was always a use for it, whether it was to float my chickens or to put my wash tubs on so I could stump my clothes clean. I never heard of the old women stumping their clothes, but I can't imagine why they wouldn't because your legs are so much stronger than your arms, and your wrists get so tired, and your knuckles get so sore with the scrubbing. So this is something that maybe I find out through some new resource that they, they stomp their, their clothes. But we had a chainsaw, which I'm sure they would have loved if they would have had one. And perhaps some later generations of uh, the Bayou Shaners did have chainsaws because some people were still out there the last people moved in the 1950s, I think. The real exodus started after the 1927 flood. Yep, we probably would have just faded into history, if not for C.C. C. Lockwood. He, his first article in National Geographic brought the Atchafalaya to the attention of not just people in Louisiana, but to the whole world. We, of course, had no idea that because our lives were being photographed by him that we would become documented part of history. Uh, it, it just didn't occur to us. And I don't even know if it occurred to CC how important what he was documenting was because he was just a young man who wanted to be a nature photographer and make his living doing, following his passion. He's here today and maybe someone can ask him if he um, had any idea that he was going to become a resource for historians. Because of all the notice, people started finding us by letters just addressed to Gwen and Preston, uh, Gwen and Alvin and the Chapalaya, asking me how we did things, um, just how to make a compost pile maybe, or how we handled our propane, I don't know, just all sorts of things. So that's why I started writing. The only two resources we had to learn how to do things was the Mother Earth magazine and the Rodale publications. And so I learned from those magazines, and then I would write things that we learned to do, like our, our chickens, how we learned to fence our chickens so that they could clean the garden and, uh, and get it ready for us, and, and they would have this extra food source because it was a double pen with the house in the middle, and whenever we were growing something on one side, the chickens were on the other side. 
and they were manuring it, and they were eating the cut worms. Oh, it's a beautiful system. I still use that system. And, uh, and I was anxious to write that for other people in those magazines. Until this first article brought me $450, and I realized that this could be a way that I could contribute to uh, what we were making fishing. And so I started taking... Uh, taking assignments about other people, not just writing about myself. And this article here, I thought it was just $450, and I was helping a few other people. But I realize now it was my first opportunity to pass it on, to become part of a chain of information that came from Mr. George Ray down through Calvin, and then me learning from him and living out there and figuring these things out and that I could pass this on to other people. It was just that simple, and I didn't even realize how important it was. So I started my writing career doing how-to articles for specialized magazines, and I just never did get past that in a lot of ways. I still, I spent most of my writing career writing practical information for people and passing along what people passed to me, whether they were agricultural researchers or a bird watcher that I interviewed. Right about the time my uh, life started changing in the swamp because so many people were then coming out there as tourists, life wasn't as uh, simple for us as it used to be. My daughter Lemon was injured and used up the either 200 or $300 we were saving for crawfish season, which normally would have been plenty of money to get us through to crawfish season. But we had to take her to a vet uh, and used up all that money. And so I took a job cooking on a riverboat, and that was where I met Preston Rowland, and my life changed. And uh, we I moved, and we got married. And he, for years, had looked at those willow thickets alongside the river boats and thought, man, you know, if a fellow could learn to do something with willow trees, there they are, free for the taking, he'd never have to set foot on a river boat again. And I said, I happen to know about that. I just read an article about that in Mother Earth magazine. If you will marry me, I will let you have the patterns to build this, this furniture. <laughs> And it was like that. He was so easy. And so <laughs> that's exactly what we did. We moved to Bro Bridge on the banks of the Bayou Teche, where his son would catch these little, uh, little uh, perch. And we ate fish just about every day when Brent was with us. And we cut the willow trees, and Preston made furniture. I uh, Actually, we had a little camper, but... Um, it was really small. We basically used it uh, to drive to Pro Bridge, and then we took it with us when we left. But our main living quarters was a deserted hog barn that the owners of the property, who rented us for $50 a month, the opportunity to live on this beautiful deserted hog farm. It was a huge concrete floor with... Uh, uh, a roof and no walls. And so we went to the Salvation Army and bought sheer panel curtains and stapled them to the top and then to the bottom and had some protection from the mosquitoes. Not a lot, but some. And it made a beautiful dwelling. There was a well there. And instead of sweeping and mopping, I just hooked up the hose. <laughs> you know? And the lady who owned the property, they had a, they had a very comfortable life in Bro Bridge. And she would bring kind of high tone friends out to visit us just to show them what we were doing with their hog barn. And we thought that was just delightful that instead of being ashamed of us or thinking we were, I don't know, hippies or something, that she would actually bring friends out there to see how I clean the floor and stuff like that. And this was our outside wall to keep the wind off our fire in the winter time. And while we were there, when we needed extra money and Preston's boys weren't staying with us, we would well. This was during the early 80s when anyone who could breathe could get a job around Bro Bridge or Lafayette because of the oil boom. But eventually, <clears throat> the boom was followed by a bust, 
and we had to go elsewhere. And uh, I forget where we went there. Oh, someone had written me a fan letter saying that uh, she lived in Naples, Florida, and um, that there was an ad in the paper for uh, an editor there. And so that was my first real job after the swamp, was editor of Naples now. But uh, there wasn't anything I did there that had to do with passing along anything. Uh, but it was just a job. And, but we eventually, as far as the topic of passing it on, we ended up in Pensacola, where I became the head of a Pensacola Heritage Foundation. Lord, that was a great job. I, I, it was not a place where I could live close to nature. It was a civilized job. I had to dress civilized and, and stuff like that. And, but it was history civilization. Uh, Pensacola has a long, long history, and I, I researched 500 years. I, uh, the Heritage Foundation bought old houses and, and fixed them, restored them, and then used them as museum, living history museums. And as their director, I was in charge of everything from talking to architects, uh, uh, the, the archaeologist who had to watch for every piece of dirt that we picked up that it would, might be important and they would need to confiscate it and that sort of thing. I, uh, I made costumes. I made all of these costumes you see here <laughs> on a $60 sewing machine I bought at the Waterfront Mission. Uh, I trained docents. I trained living history people. It was absolutely fabulous. And uh, I just basically lived in the past for the few years that we lived there. Preston continued to make furniture. We would drive all the way to the Atchafalaya for him to get uh, the willow trees. He didn't make any money, but he made furniture because we had to drive him all the way back to Pensacola and uh, make it. I became an, uh, uh, very schooled in all the everyday life of the different cultures, the Spanish, the French, um, the British, and there were two more uh, who settled Pensacola. And uh, we became Scottish dancers, and um, just it was just fun. And I feel like you don't really understand the culture till you dance in their shoes, and until you've danced in a corset, and uh, mm -hmm, you find out that you can't do big rowdy romping dances in a corset like you can do in these little soft Scottish dresses and stuff. So I learned all these wonderful things and later managed to pass it on. When we bought our place in Georgia, it's a, just a little house. We built a little house on 32 acres, and uh, it, I remember it was about the size of, of what the houseboat was, but we've since enlarged the kitchen. And there I had a job with a, a grants program, uh, a USDA grants program. We gave money to researchers to research sustainable agriculture. When Calvin and I lived in the swamp, sustainable agriculture wasn't a word. It wasn't a term yet. We just did things the old way, and that's a lot like sustainable agriculture. And now I lucked into this incredible job where I interviewed researchers every day and translated those into stories that farmers could use on their farms. And I did that for almost 20 years, and I learned so much. And by in that very job, I was passing along the information that I was getting from the farmers and the researchers. And it was such a good feeling. And then, of course, I would come home and practice this stuff. Pressed, I found this great little chicken coop that you could move around. It could hold 20 chickens, and you would move it around and, have, and, and put it in different places in your orchard or your pasture for them to eat the insects, and uh, Preston built that for me. And I read about manure water, and for one whole year did all these drums full of manure water before I decided it wasn't worth all the trouble. But it was fun that year that I did it. And so I put to use all these things, and for 30 years I've been growing all this wonderful food and uh, sharing it with other people. Preston makes furniture for us and for sale through uh, the trees that fall down on our property. And he's made a lot of furniture. 
There's a porch full of it, all different styles, just whatever he feels like making that day, he does it. We're still passing it on. We helped start some farmer's markets in our area where uh, <clears throat> we can talk to people and uh, share growing tips and preserving tips and things like that. At home, I still hang my clothes on the line and I still make jelly and stuff like that. And always willing to tell other people about what I'm doing and how I do it. These people at the farmers market and the dance groups and stuff became my core group. Whenever you do something you love and you start swapping information with people, it creates a bond. And even if you don't live real close together, just that communication creates a bond that you don't get just talking to people. Uh, doing things together is how we learn to do a lot of the things on a farm, and we help each other. At the experiment station, we always had about 300 or so uh, international students. And when a person comes here, they have from another country, they generally only have notions of what life is like in the United States from what they see in the movies and on TV. And so we were always looking for students who wanted to come out to our house for a holiday or just, just to come spend a, a weekend day with us. And they would often uh, make jelly with me and things like that to see how people used to live in the United States that we still do. Sometimes my Pike County neighbors bring their daughters or granddaughters to learn to make jelly or ketchup or something like that because that has been lost in their family and they want them to have that kind of enrichment. We shared our skills by having um, group chicken processing days with other people who were wanting to raise their own pastured poultry to put in the freezer. And Preston built us a fabulous evisceration table where cold, clean water flows down over your hands from this, this white pipe. The table is slanted so that all the entrails flow down with the water to a bucket on the end that drains and uh, then we take the feathers and the entrails off later. Just a beautiful system. Four people can process 80 to 100 birds in a half a day. And a chicken plucker, he, he invented one of those. He didn't invent it, but he built it. And it plucks in about 18 seconds two big fat birds. And it used to take two people 15 minutes to get that picture down in the bottom. And uh, and a lot of people are still using that. We no longer raise chickens. We don't eat enough. I uh, pet, take care of pets for one of the women who still does raise and kill her own chickens. And she gives me a frozen chicken every time I take care of her pets. Over the years, we demonstrated woodworking, butter making, horse keeping, and other rural skills at uh, local heritage events. Just loads of fun. My dance group was, for years, 20 years, 30 years, uh, the center of my social life. On one of my jobs, we learned how to do old-time dancing, contra dancing, English country dancing. And everywhere I lived, I would start a dance group in my living room. And when it got too big for the living room, we'd start taking up money to rent a community place and stuff. And uh, in Pensacola, it, got to be about 85 people, and we ended up with three bands that started because there's no need for an old-time band if you don't have an audience, especially if you don't have dancers. So by us starting the group with recorded music, we eventually had three different bands that could play for us. That was awesome. And when I started our group in, Pensacola, in, uh, in Georgia, where I am, I started at the experiment station where we worked, and at some times later, as the group grew, uh, we had a community center just chock full of people and live 
live band coming from Atlanta to play for us. It was so joyful. I guess I taught hundreds of people, and I hope at least some of those people are now teaching dance in their communities. Oh, definitely passed along information through my articles about uh, all the things that from I wrote everything from dance to sustainable agriculture. Sometimes editors would even ask me to go learn something that uh, I wanted to write about. And this was Delta Sky Magazine asked me to pick a folk school somewhere and go learn. And I learned how to make a basket from an oak tree where you start with an actual log and, uh, and make strips out of it. And it took a week to make a basket and a lot of Band-Aids. But uh, it, it ended up being one of my favorite stories ever. And then, of course, the big one, the big pass it on, came in 2004 when uh, one of CeCe's photos um, of, uh, of Calvin and me was in a, a National Geographic magazine and got a lot of notice. And a reporter called me and asked to do a where are they now story about Calvin and me. And I said, it's okay with me. If it's okay with Calvin, it was okay with Calvin. So uh, Ed Cullen, in that article, that beautiful article that they did, uh, he generously gave a whole column to one of my old stories that I wrote back in the swamp. And that's a big deal for a writer to give up that much space. And from that being published, I was later invited by an editor at LSU Press to submit a proposal for a book. And I thought, who's going to want a book about us two kids? But LSU Press thought somebody would want to read it, and they published it. And it wasn't long after that that Christina Melton the, saw it in a bookstore and had the idea to approach LPB to do a documentary. And now it's, it's, now it's the 2022 selection for One Book, One Community here. I mean, it's just more than I, so much more than I ever dreamed would happen. But every one of these steps couldn't have taken place without those people at Bayou Shane handing down those skills, handing down that passion, that the George, Mr. George Ray and other people passed along to Calvin, and then these old people passed along to me, and that we started making those stories out of them. Now, in the new century, we have ways of finding out the truth of some things that were mysteries. Bob Carline sent me this sheriff's report from July 24, 1859. And it says that the sheriff writes, I was called at about 2 o'clock this morning by two men sent here by Esquire Tuell with a letter notifying me a man had been burned to death at Madame Bersham's by Dutch Mike and one Kirk. I went up on the steamer Rusk to Bayou Shane and helped to hold a coroner's inquest William Moody, the person burned to death by pouring spirits of turpentine on him and setting fire to him. Dutch Mike was in custody and a writ was issued for the arrest of Kirk and three men sent after him. Well, Bob found this on microfilm, which of course Mama Josephine never saw, and this was two generations before her that apparently that house that she was raised in that was a or was something that would have been more suited to this kind of a violent act. So she didn't sanitize it. She only told the truth that she knew at the time. And whenever you read about the history of the settlement of that area, in the 17 and 1800s, it was a much rougher place because there were not so many families there. It was more traders coming through, timber people coming through. And by the time Momo was born, then there were families and communities, and there were, it was a much different place. And it made me feel so good to know, to find out that I could have believed her stories all those years. 
From the Bayou Fa Shane Facebook site, now I can see that the houses she described really like that. There were two-story houses out there, charming little houseboats with Victorian uh, trim on it. And then one day I finally saw the picture of the post office itself, and I got cold chills. The house was exactly the way she had described it. And Bob Carter, somebody put it up there, because the pictures are sent in by all, descend, all these different descendants. And sometimes somebody have the picture and not know what it's of, and somebody else will say, I've got that same picture, and it's got such and such written on the back. And Bob Carlin, whoever sent it to him, even mentioned a black pepper. And through the site, through the, the new site, the pictures I can see from the old days, I see things like uh, what a hardy people they were who lived close to the land. And uh, I remember reading this woman was someone who was married to my grandma's brother as his second wife after his first wife died and uh, and her daughter was married to him and when you think about how many men died from accidents and how many women died in childbirth people did just sometimes marry three or four times in their lifetime and everyone was kin to everybody and that makes sense that what Momo remembered that everybody got along because when you're when you're married to somebody it's just like when the royal families marry one country to another it helps keep the peace and this beautiful picture of these little boys playing with the dead ducks I don't even know who they are it came up but just aren't they beautiful children look at that skin Look at the, the robust bodies. That tells you this was a good quality of life. And also, they were children who knew where their food came from. What I have wondered about this picture is there probably wasn't a big cash flow in these families, and yet somebody came in and said, Honey, get the boys and get the camera. I want to take pictures of the boys with these ducks. Because that would have been an expense, wouldn't it? And I'm so glad they took that picture. I'm so glad that families down through the years kept this picture and that Bob, Sh Bob Carline started the Bayou Shame Facebook site so we can all enjoy it. Here's just some more of these beautiful photographs uh, that people kept and that we can now look at. And because now it's gone, 150 years of settlement by Anglo-European people and 1,500 years ago, indigenous people before. And when Calvin and I lived out there, so much water and silt has come. I think once or twice we went out to Bayou Shane itself and those giant live oaks that you saw in the picture of the dinner on the ground, there were just, a, from what I remember, just a few feet of them sticking up out of the sand. It's just covered. So now I've produced my own Celtic knot of handed down stories and personal experience and research culminated in two books. The first one, The Atchafalaya uh, Houseboat, is my own memoir so that a resource for history because I told our story, Calvin and I, put this information together and as we lived it. And I'm also passing along grandma's story still through that book and also through the second one, which came about in a kind of sneaky way because I had just turned in the manuscript for how when I couldn't sleep for thinking about the woman who had been rocking her baby in the chair and it fell off the barge. And Al Seed would tell that story, and when he got to the end about how the baby was found floating high because of the dress trapping the water, uh, uh, the air under it, everyone would laugh but me, because I thought that woman must have been terrified for those few minutes it took for her to get her baby back. And, and he would tell other stories. The man who was sitting astride the still when it blew up, oh yeah, he told that one a lot. And I did not see where it was as much funny as it was 
how did this happen? And I wanted to know those stories, but there was no one to tell me. Even at the time I see all of them, I doubt if there was any, because I heard different versions of all of those stories, you know. Al Seed would tell it differently one time and another. Peter Bunch would disagree with him about the details. And so it was like that meandering Celtic knot of water in Momo's stories. They had a different flavor every t as they filtered through these different people. And I wanted to read a book that gave these people hair colors and personalities and names. I came to the breakfast table and told Preston, I cannot believe I am saying this, but I'm going to have to write a novel because no one else is going to write it. And that's what I found was online. There was nothing. This is about very early 2000s, and there was almost nothing on Google about Bayou Shane except this uh, postcard, on this envelope that you see here because it was being auctioned at an auction house in New York City. And the reason it was being auctioned is it never got to where it was supposed to go. Someone from Bayou Shane mailed this postcard, that it was an, an envelope, to someone in France right before the Civil War, a few weeks before the mail service to the southern states was cut off. And it went to a regional facility in Kentucky where that postmaster was supposed to throw them away, but he was the kind of postmaster that couldn't throw mail away even though he was supposed to. And he kept them in a, one box, all these that came in, not just from Louisiana, but other states in his region. And a, few gen, a couple generations of postmasters later, someone found that box and returned them. And, and that's where they went out. Now, in my story, this letter actually makes it back to Bayou Shane in 1907, 40 some years after it had been mailed. And I thought, wow, because it, it didn't really get returned. It's, it, it got auctioned in New York City, but I thought, what if that letter was returned? What would that do in that community? Somebody would be surprised. Somebody might still be alive. And so I started the book with the letter, all those other stories that I had heard and wondered, and that's how I put it together. And this is how you can do these things, too. You don't even have to be a writer. You can pass things along by being a postmaster. If that postmaster had never had thrown those letters away, I had never seen that. My curiosity may not have been stirred enough to think, I can write a novel. It was the furthest thing from my mind. And you can do this by handing down your recipe. Uh, teaching your kids an old game. Do you realize now that a game you played in the 70s might be falling out of, the, of your family, a game that was important to you. So these are ways that, that you can do this without even having to be a writer. But uh, I just hope that somebody here today takes this to heart and that I've connected with somebody that thinks they can go home and do this just by recording someone older than you or telling your story to someone younger than you. And you never know when you're going to change hearts and change lives with that story. That's the end of the official talk. So. And answers. That's right. And we will either put the microphone in front of you or we will repeat your question so that all may hear. So first of all, anybody in this quadrant, does anyone have a question for Miss Quinn? Because I always do. All right, I'm going to come over here. Yes, we'll start right here without shipping. Miss Quinn, did you garden in the Chapala Basin? What crops did you uh, select and how did you protect them from wildlife? You know, we never, uh, had a problem with wildlife coming 
bother the crops. If I'm wrong, Calvin can correct me, but I don't remember that. We grew your usual, uh, probably the same things that people grew in the Shane back when there was a community. Tomatoes, bell peppers, hot peppers, uh, onions one year, at least one year. We always had green onions. Snap beans. I don't remember growing butter beans. Am I leaving anything out? Yeah. Corn, corn yeah. <laughs> one, at least one year we did take up room for corn, which C.C. Lockwood loved. He said, he said the only way it could be fresher was to, to, hold the, uh, to just hold the stalk over into the boiling water and let it boil right there on the stalk. I had totally forgotten that. Pardon? Was it ever fun over there? Oh, every day was fun. Even the work was fun. Um, we would start our day by jumping off the barge and swimming across the river to have our morning shower and stuff over on a sandbar. Don't you think that? So, so mention the alligators, Ms. Glenn, right here. <laughs> mention alligators? You didn't see. No. You know, Calvin and I were just talking about this before the program started, and he, he remembers that we saw one gator from a distance. And, uh, it, it, you know, it, they just they were at a low point in their life. They were not used to people being around. And the only time we saw him, I think, is because the water was so low. He came, it came out, of it, and not at all like, like it is now. Right, so we're not telling you to do that today. <laughs> yeah. Ms. Quinn, uh, for, this, for you and Mr. Callum, out of all the places that was accessible, gentlemen, what made you pick Bayou Shane? That's where our families were from. In fact, the place where we were tied up first, Calvin's family still owned the acreage back there. The very tip of it, I think we leased from Texaco for $1 a year. Was it Texaco, Calvin? But. <laughs> I don't remember us ever talking about moving across the basin. Um, our families had lived right in that stretch where we were, uh, Jake's by, Bloody by, down to Simpson. Uh, Calvin's grandma was uh, raised on Simpson, by Simpson, which I think now is all dried up. Yes, yes. This front row is the best row on the I remember one day my mama used to visit us all the time, so that ought to tell you something. And we were I'm <laughs> 
Myself. Another question. Thank you. 